We are in a quorum call. Madam Pre President, I ask that the proceedings of the quorum be dispensed with. Without objection. Thank you, Madam President. Well, first of all, Madam President, let me uh, thank you and, and all of the floor staff and others who are here, I think on a beautiful Saturday in the end of July. Um, we all wish perhaps we were somewhere else other than on the floor of the Senate. But for the 30 years that I've been involved in political discussions in Virginia and some at a national level, we have had president after president, Congress after Congress, talk about the generational of unmet needs in infrastructure. We've seen our roads and bridges start to crumble. The estimates are close to, depending on that survey, 14,000 bridges that are, that are in decaying state. And in, in my state, over 700 bridges. We know the potholes that, in many of our roads and highways. We know our airports resemble third world nations, not the United States of America. We know our ports have not kept up with modern technology. We know that many of our shorelines are dealing with the unprecedented effects of sea level rise. We know after COVID that high-speed internet connectivity is not a nice to have, but essential and something that the presiding officer has taken a legislative lead on. We know that it's time to get past talking about infrastructure and finally do something. That's why I've been proud to be part of this bipartisan effort working with the White House to produce a historic piece of legislation, $550 billion of new spending over five years that in every category I just mentioned will make historic investments. I've been a little surprised, to tell you the truth, that some of our colleagues on the other side who are not part of the bipartisan group have suddenly said, no, we can't do infrastructure now. And they were all for it. President Trump was in, but now they find excuses why not. I have to also tell you, I've been a little bit surprised even on some of the colleagues on my side of the aisle. When the deal that we've structured is literally twice as much as where the earlier negotiations were between President Biden and some of the Republican committee chairs or committee leaders. And there's been some of a sense of, well, you know, infrastructure, that shouldn't be that hard to do. Well, it wasn't hard to do. Why has it taken us 30 years to get to this moment? I hope, and I know we are finalizing the last couple pieces of legislative language, I hope that we will get that finished as soon as possible so we can get this bill on the floor, have amendments, have a debate, but at the end of the day, pass this historic legislation and finally put our money where our mouths have been in terms of talking about the needs of infrastructure in this country. I know, Madam President, that you've not had a probably a lot of people rushing to the floor today, so I'm going to take an extra minute or two. Um, doesn't mean you have to stay riveted to each moment. But I want to talk about this for a few moments um, in terms of what this will do for, for my state, for the Commonwealth of Virginia. In the Commonwealth of Virginia, investment in infrastructure has been something that has eluded us for years. I have to acknowledge when I was governor, I tried to find funding, meet funding needs, particularly in Northern Virginia, Hampton Roads, and put forward, at that point, bipartisan supported tax referendums in Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads. It was horribly unsuccessful at getting that done. A number of years later, a subsequent governor, Governor McDonald, managed to make a down payment on some of the infrastructure needs in Virginia but not really address on a more comprehensive way the Commonwealth's needs. So I'm going to take a couple moments now and talk about section by section in, the, in Virginia what this bipartisan White House supported record infrastructure investment will mean 
to the people of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Let me start with Hampton Roads. Hampton Roads, Southeast Virginia, the peninsula, is at most at risk from concerns about sea level rise and questions about resiliency more than any other region in the whole country with the exception of New Orleans. In Hampton Roads, local leaders, our Navy, nonprofits, businesses have all come together and said, we need to make sure that we grapple with sea level rise. It is ranked by most in those communities as the number one issue. Well, we passed this legislation, $47 billion will go into sea level rise, prevention and resiliency. That'll mean a whole host of projects in Norfolk, in Portsmouth, in Virginia Beach, in Chesapeake, will all be finally addressed. We've got to make sure that Hampton Roads is not subject to this kind of devastating effect of sea level rise. We also know in Hampton Roads that we need more rail. We've opened recently some rail down through the peninsula, but not enough. We've got to make sure that rail that goes from Richmond doesn't leave off as a cul-de-sac the peninsula and Southampton Roads. With a $66 billion investment in rail, we may soon be able to see that become a reality. Hampton Roads as well is home to the Port of Virginia. The Port of Virginia, one of the biggest ports on the whole East Coast. But if we don't continue to upgrade that port, if we don't continue to deepen the channel, if we don't make the investments in the Craney Island expansion, if we don't stay competitive, that port, which is the economic engine driver, not just of Hampton Roads, but in many ways of most of the Commonwealth, will not stay competitive. This legislation will provide $17 billion, a record amount of investment in our ports. And I can promise you, the Port of Virginia will get a share of those resources. And finally, on just the plain old issue of roads. Hampton Roads is disconnected from what we call the peninsula in Virginia, and we've got two crossings, which oftentimes, particularly during summer months, can lead to multiple hour backups through our bridge tunnels. If we make this $110 billion investment in roads and bridges, we could potentially see that third crossing come into reality. What we could also make sure is that we could finally finish the widening of Interstate 64 between Norfolk and Richmond. I talked about this when I ran for governor as governor. I said, wouldn't it be great if in our lifetimes we could actually finish this project? Well, if we pass this bipartisan piece of legislation, the I-64 project widening from Norfolk to Richmond will be finished. This is incredibly important for the people of Hampton Roads, the Eastern Shore, the Peninsula, the Northern Neck, to make these investments. Let's move up the road to our capital, Richmond, in the Richmond area. Last week, I was looking at the Mayo Bridge, one of the historic bridges, almost 100, over 100 years old. Saw how decaying it was, saw what the water damage was taking place. That bridge, without remediation, could be forced to close if we don't make the needed investments. Well, this bipartisan legislation will commit $110 billion for highway and bridge improvements, Mayo Bridge, and a host of the other 700 bridge, bridges in Virginia that are decaying will get fixed. We need to make that happen. Richmond as well has got one of the most aggressive bus transit systems not only in Virginia, but the whole common, but in the whole country. We've made huge investments, close to $40 billion, in transit in this legislation. And some of the Richmond bus transit needs will be addressed. We also know in the Richmond area and across the Commonwealth, we have a lot of airports. One of the things we need to continue to do is invest in our airports. Richmond Airport is always in need of additional expansion, $25 billion to improve our airports across the country, the Richmond Airport, the Norfolk Airport, 
the Newport News Airport, obviously the Roanoke Airport and others, Dulles National, will be improved as long as the host of regional air, smaller regional airports across the Commonwealth if we make this investment. They come up to our region here where I live, in Northern Virginia. I'm very proud of working with Tim Kaine and Senators from, Maine, from Maryland. We made sure this legislation included a full eight-year reauthorization of our metro system. We made sure that we're making record investments in transit so that we can get metro back up operating again on a full schedule and we can make the needed safety improvements that have been plaguing Metro for a number of years. We also know that we've got to continue to build out additional Metro stations in Northern Virginia. One at Potomac Yard that will be extraordinarily important to the Innovation Center and the Amazon 2 headquarters. We've got to make sure as well because Metro is moving to zero emission buses. That's a good news for our climate and for our community. The question is, where are those zero emission buses going to be built? This legislation as well makes record investment in electric and other low carbon and no carbon buses so they can be built here, not in China. Our record investment in transit will also make dramatic improvements for the VRE, for the Manassas line. Let's get more people out of their cars into the VRE, whether it's the Manassas or Fredericksburg. Needed investments will be made if we pass this legislation. Another project, if we're going to open up rail in Virginia, we've got to make sure we have another bridge, rail bridge, across the Potomac. So the Long Bridge project, which I've been working with Governor Northam and Senator Kane on, this kind of investment will make that happen. And as anybody who lives in Northern Virginia knows, I live, as, as somebody who lives in Alexandria, traffic is the bane of our existence. There will be a host of improvements that will get done if we pass this legislation. Let me talk about one in particular. Route 1 from Alexandria through Fairfax into Prince William County. We know how clogged and congested it has been. We've been looking for additional funding literally for decades on Route 1. We pass this legislation. It'll get done. Let me move a little bit further west in our state, out towards the Shenandoah Valley and Roanoke and southwest. For years, We've been talking about the danger on I-81. Literally, there have been prayer groups formed to pray for people who would travel on I-81 because there are so much truck traffic there that it has, frankly, impeded the safety of, of tra the traveling public. We've been talking about making improvements and expansions to 81 capacity for 20 years. We've been talking about how do we get the trucks off of I-81? How do we bring more rail down to southwest in Southside. Well, we pass this legislation, you, we will see those 81 corridor improvements that we've all been waiting for. We will see rail not only go to Lynchburg and Roanoke, but extend on down to Blacksburg and Christiansburg, and hopefully all the way down to Bristol. This is terribly important to make sure that those communities have a multimodal form of transportation opportunities making sure we get those trucks off of I-81, something we've been talking about for a long time. We increase the rail capacity, both freight and passenger, we'll be able to do that. We also know in Southside and Southwest, post-COVID, that high-speed internet connectivity is not a nice to have, but an absolute necessity. A top priority of mine is somebody who spent more years in the telecommunications industry than I have in politics, is to make sure that we make those connections. This legislation, historic legislation, $65 billion for broadband. That investment, building on Governor, Governor Northam's $700 million investment from Virginia, American Rescue Plan funds, will make sure that every household across the Commonwealth has access to high-speed internet connectivity, not five years from now or 10 years from now, but in the next couple of years. And finally, across Southwest Virginia, and for that matter, across all of Virginia, we still have families in far Southwest that don't have access to clean drinking water on a regular basis, that still have to sometimes haul their water in the back of a pickup truck up to some cistern 
and they don't have access to clean drinking water in 2021. Well, $55 billion will go to water projects in this legislation. And whether they be access to clean drinking water on a regular basis, or whether it be taking out the lead pipes that haunt too many of our urban communities, or the st storm and sewer systems that are frankly, in some cases, 60, 70, 80 years old and simply wearing out, we can make that investment as well. Now, there are a series of other areas in this legislation that are equally important. But at the end of the day, you know, I can't think of a, of a bill that I've worked on that will have more direct effect on the lives of every Virginian over the next five years in terms of how you get to work, how you get to school, how you manage to take the kids out on the weekends, how our commerce moves, how we get our water, how we get our internet, than this record-setting $550 billion bipartisan investment in infrastructure. It's time for the Senate to take this bill up. I, again, commend all of my colleagues who've been working on this legislation, not just the so-called G10, but the G22. I want to thank Leader Schumer for his good work, continuing to push this legislation forward. I want to thank the White House for its constant involvement. I even want to commend Leader McConnell for voting with this bipartisan group to move this legislation along. We've talked about this for 30 years. We are literally days away from this passing the United States Senate. We've got to finish the job and get it done. With that, Madam President, I um, hope I have kept you riveted. And now you are fully familiar with all the needs of Virginia. I'm sure you could address similar needs in Minnesota. Uh, but I thank the presiding officer and all, all of the staffs who are here working on this Saturday, last day in July in the summer to get this job done. And with that, I note the absence. I yield the floor. I don't yield the floor. I, I've been a little surprised that the presiding officers asked me to speak for another 30 minutes, but I, I, um, I will choose not to do that because I have great respect for the floor staff. So I ask unanimous consent that the Senate recess subject to the call of the chair. Is there objection? Without objection. Without objection. Recess subject to the call of the chair. Recess subject to the call of the chair.